I am going to read you a short story. Please remember as many details as possible. Just kidding. (laughs) Don't stress. I don't know anyone who gets excited about having their memory evaluated, but I do know lots of people who are fearful of losing their memory. Maybe you are one of those people. If you watched someone you love decline with dementia, you are perhaps starting to investigate your own risks. If you want a non-invasive way to assess your own risk of cognitive decline, spend an easy three minutes completing my brain health quiz and get helpful suggestions based on your results to your inbox. Go to www.rootcausology.com quiz to get started. That is www.rootcausology.com slash quiz. Welcome to Get to the Root of It. I'm Laurel Brennan, the host, and I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Sakina Bunch today. She is an Army veteran, a doctor of naturopathy, a certified integrative nutrition health coach, a multi best-selling author, an international and TEDx speaker, and owner at Clean Good Eats. Lean to the side just for a second and they can see your your sign behind you, Clean Good Eats. If you're on YouTube, if you're on, (laughs) if you're listening, you can't see it. She has a great sign behind her. Welcome, Dr. Bunch. Thank you for thank, being here. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate this. <laughs> so you have, I think, a powerful journey, um, a powerful why to what brought you to where you are. Would you mind sharing that to start? Sure. My daughter was allergic to everything but four foods. She could have cucumbers, bison, turkey, and iceberg lettuce. That's all she could have for 10 months. And I did not know how to cook. So that makes it kind of difficult to keep your child alive when you don't know how to cook, especially those things, because there was no microwavable bison about 20 years ago. So we had to figure out what to do and how to do it. We didn't really get much help from conventional medicine. So we wound up turning to alternative medicine. And that's when we found out that my daughter had a huge gut issue that we had to handle. Then in addition to that, we found out my husband had a chromosome deficiency that not many people know about in this country, but in many African countries, it's very prevalent and it's called G6PD. And what that is, it's a chromosome deficiency where you have anemia and your red blood cells begin to splice more quickly than they're reproduced. And what brings that on, at least we found, was legumes. My husband couldn't have any type of a legume. He couldn't have processed food, no soy, none of that. And we figured this out when we went vegan for a year. And of course, you know, on a vegan diet, your protein source is legumes. And he was, it was almost like he had Alzheimer's. He was forgetting everything. And that's when he went to the doctor and we figured out what was going on. Wow. Yeah, I'm not familiar. That's not sickle cell anemia. No, different. Okay. No, that's, that's new to me. Thank you for, for sharing your, your story. You, it was out of, out of love to take care of your family members that you went on a journey to figure out how to optimally feed them. Right. Yes. So so what happened as part of that journey, you figured out how to cook bison and turkey and you figured out <laughs> and you went I can make bison any that. way you want. <laughs> so so what what was next? So that's when I decided, okay, well, I can't be the only one going through this. And we figured out because that's you know, that's very isolating. My daughter was allergic to carrots, just being in the room with them. So that's very isolating. You can't go to potlucks, everybody wants to bring a veggie platter. So we really had to figure out how do we go about healing her gut. We found supplements, whole food supplements that we were able to take for her, enzymes that she was able to take. And we finally wound up healing her gut. So she's 24 today. 
<laughs> and she can eat pretty much anything except maybe avocados and I think like one other thing. But other than that, she's good. Awesome. So it was a successful transition for her when she figured out how, and you figured out how to feed her and heal the gut. Yeah, it, it, it did take a while though. I will admit that. Sometimes people think it's a quick turnaround thing. It took a while. So we were able to heal her gut the first time. But, you know, when you go back to those foods that you've been allergic to for so long and you continue to eat them, for example, hazelnut. She was allergic, like severely allergic to hazelnut. And she loved Starbucks. <laughs> and Starbucks loved their hazelnut. And when she was 15, she wound up going through it again. She lost rapid weight in a span of two weeks and we had to go through the whole process again. And it took maybe about a year and a half to really get her back to where she needed to be. Wow. So was were these true allergies or were these intolerances? These were true allergies. Like when she would eat pineapples, her throat would swell up. Her tongue would swell up. She would start having an asthma attack. Whenever she was around carrots, she would break out in hives. It was, it was horrible. <laughs> My goodness, mm -hmm. that's that would be challenging for anyone, but especially for a child. It is, and I want to add this caveat too, um, and a, a caveat as as a warning. A lot of times, when when I was in the military, I was a lab tech, so I believed everything that the doctors told me. Nothing against doctors. I'm a doctor. Nothing against doctors. But as parents, we have to be advocates for our children. I was told that when we went to this alternative medicine doctor, that I needed to follow these allergies up, you know, the, the allergy testing with a blood test. So we went to our regular doctor for that, and she was not quite happy <laughs> to do this. But when we finally convinced her to do it, she wanted to send my daughter to an allergist. Now, my, my daughter had been to an allergist. She had been on allergy shots for three years. And they were only making her worse. It didn't make her better. And as a parent, there comes a time when you just have to say enough is enough and we're going to do something different. And so it was at that time when we decided to do something different, that's when she began to heal. Yeah. So you just have to know your kid to be an advocate. <laughs> yeah, that's such a good point as, as a parent and, and also for yourself. We have to advocate for our children, for ourselves. When we know something is up, and even if the clinician in front of us can't quite see it, that I have a similar journey in that I went into functional medicine because standard medicine was not helping my daughter. Very similar. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you became a health coach and a naturopathic doctor. Yes. And then you opened up. Clean Good Eats, the sign behind you. So that is, well, maybe maybe I skipped a few steps. <laughs> Fill me in. <laughs> so yes, I became a health coach and my husband and I started doing cooking classes. And it's funny because we had no intention on doing cooking classes. We just had a friend whose daughter would only eat bananas. <laughs> I'm like, okay, she would have like, you know, eight, nine bananas a day, right? And a half a serving of a banana is a serving. So she was bouncing off the walls at five years old because of all that sugar. And I said, you know what? I'm going to help you feed your daughter. So we made spinach pizza. Now, spinach pizza is green. <laughs> and she said, oh, she's not going to eat this. And I said, well, why wouldn't she eat it? She's like, because it looks gross. I said, because you won't eat it. That's why she won't eat it. Mm. I said, but I want you to go home and make this with her. Don't make it for her. Make it with her. So she went home, she made it with her and they were, you know, like little tortilla sized pizzas and the little girl was only five, but she ate three of them, three of them. And all she had been eating up until this point were bananas. And she calls me back and she says, oh my goodness, I would pay you to do this. And I said, really? <laughs> oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> yes. So that's how Clean Good Eats came to be. And my husband and I started doing cooking classes, but we didn't want to start with the kids because we know yeah, when you start with the kids, things change. We wanted to start with the parents 
because at that point I realized the kids follow what the parents do. So if we can get the parents on board, then we can get the kids on board. So we started a class called Intimacy Begins in the Kitchen. And it's so amazing the fruit that has come from this class. We still do this class every Valentine's Day till this day. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. So from that, after we established that, then I became a naturopathic doctor. <laughs> and we have our brick and mortar now. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that you had that friend who said she'd pay you and inspired this because yes. when you told me about Clean Good Eats, I got so excited. I thought every single community needs one. Can you please like open a, a school? Oh, that would be great. Wouldn't you teach everybody how to do this? Yes. Because um, I, I agree and I've experienced the same in that if the parent is excited about the food, the kids get excited about the food. Mm -hmm. I remember my, my son, who's now 12, when he was probably three or four, mm -hmm. we were in the garden. We had a, a friend who had a, um, a biodynamic farm and I'd never eaten okra before. I didn't, I didn't know what okra was mm -hmm. and she was growing okra and she just like picked it off the stock and took a bite. And I didn't, I didn't flinch. So he took it off the stock and took a bite and he was just eating okra, <laughs> fresh okra right off the stock. And that became his new like thing to do. He will just literally take a chunk of cabbage and <laughs> eat it raw. Like you are a strange child, but <laughs> because that started when he was little, yeah. you know, well, just think to how think. healthy his immune system would be in his gut, you know, from that. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about Clean Good Eats and what you do and what's a, what's a day look like for you? Oh, gosh, what a, what a day. Well, Clean, Clean Good Eats is a farm-to-table cooking studio that is open to the public. And it's quite funny because where we live, we're in Kentucky, and they didn't quite know how to establish us. We're not a school. <laughs> we're not a restaurant. So they didn't quite know how to establish us. But we are a farm to table cooking studio that is open to the general public. And we love to use the produce and the products from local farmers. We firmly believe that the more local, the better. And the majority of the products that we use are organic because we're firm believers, the less pesticides and things that are on your foods, less gets into your body. So that's our premise. And because of my daughter's background, we specialize in allergy-friendly cooking. So that's the, the gist of Clean Good Eats. But the services that we offer, we offer catering because we realize that in a lot of catering, organic foods are not taken into account. You know, I, I see a lot of foods where people can't eat it because of the allergies that they have. So organic catering and, and farm-to-table catering is, is key for us. We also have many youth classes. Again, we definitely want to pour into the youth. And it's beautiful to see how much they really want to cook. They want to know what's in their food. We did a class, and our classes are always fun. Like, I love interaction, right? So we have a class where it's throughout the school year. So we have September to May, and we teach them in the beginning the basics, which knives to use, how to use the knife, how to hold the knife, right? But then we culminate that at the end of the year where they're able to plan, prep, cook, and serve a full course meal to their parents. They come up with the recipes. They do everything. Right. And I love that because it empowers them. Kids just want to feel empowered. So that's a class that we have for them. And then every Friday and every Saturday, we have classes for the adults or pretty much anyone 10 and over. They have to be able to see over the countertop. <laughs> so <laughs> anyone 10 and over, we have classes for them and private and corporate events. So amazing. Again, yeah. I wish you were in my community. <laughs> We have a new, what they call a maker space at the library, which has potential, has mm. potential where they're holding cooking classes for the community. But every time I look, it's usually stuff 
that I wouldn't eat. Yeah. So how is your class as a naturopath different mm -hmm. than a cooking class where they're teaching people how to make pancakes, like yeah. regular old pancakes? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a great question. So we understand, especially where we are. I mean, we're in bourbon country. When we first moved here, we're in Radcliffe, Kentucky. So when we first moved here 10 years ago, there were no restaurants that you could go in, sit down and have a meal that you wouldn't feel was, you know, covered in grease at some point. <laughs> so the progression has, it's, it's slowly coming. And when we first opened, we were told, oh, this won't last here because people don't want this. Mm -hmm. People want it. And sometimes we don't know what we need. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know what we need. Therefore, we don't know what we want. But the community, thank God, they have opened us with welcome, welcoming arms. But what we do is we have classes that they can identify with. So, for example, we had a ramen class. Everybody loves ramen noodles, right? But in this class... We teach you why we use certain ingredients and why we don't use other ingredients. So we passed around a regular packet of ramen and everyone was able to look at the ingredients. And I said, I'll, I'll give $100 to anyone who can pronounce all these ingredients and know <laughs> what they are. No one could do it, right? But then we passed around the ingredients of the ramen we used and it was organic and only two ingredients. So one ingredient was... I think it was rice flour and the other one was millet flour. And that was it. That's it. So they were like, oh my goodness, we didn't realize that we could have the same foods, but just using different ingredients. So that's what we do. I don't want to say we lure you in that way, <laughs> but that's what we do. We even have a burger class that's coming up. We are making bison burgers and we're making beef burgers and they're all organic. It's just a different ingredient list that we use. Yeah. I'm assuming plant forward, lots of vegetables. Yes. How do you get, how do you get the, the kids and, and the adults who are not used to, to veggies to eat their veggies? You hide or, them. You hide, them. You hide them. So there's a spinach dip that I make and they absolutely love it. They were like, this is, this is spinach. Yes. It is spinach and it's not covered in a whole bunch of gunk. So we have spinach in there. We have peppers in there. We have onions in there. So we have these things and I like to sweeten my food with dates. So we don't use the sugars if we don't have to. Now, obviously in baking, you know, you have to use a certain amount of sugar, right? But that's few and far between. We tend to use the more naturally based sugars like date and not just the date sugar, but the whole date. Because we know fiber is important to keep everything moving. But yeah, we just hide it. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I have a client who said she only accidentally ate cauliflower when her husband tricked her. And she thought it was rice. Like everybody was like sitting around the table waiting for her to respond. And she's eating and they're all quiet and waiting. And like, so what do you think? She's like, it's good. They all start laughing. She's like, what? Like you're eating cauliflower. What? You know, she's there. She doesn't like any, any food but they tricked her into eating cauliflower because it looked like rice and there was a whole bunch of stuff mixed in with it. Right. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes we just don't know what we, what we like because we've never had it in a way that we've liked it. Right. I remember as a new parent learning that kids need to try something 17 times before they know if they like it or don't like it. So if they spit it out 16 times, <laughs> try again. Yes, so they, they might end up really liking it. And you know, too, my son, my son was the pickiest. So I have three children. My youngest was the pickiest. Because of my husband's condition, my daughter's condition, and my son being picky, I wound up making four meals for every meal. It was exhausting. But what I learned was with my son, he didn't like any vegetable that had a color. So he didn't like, he didn't like sweet potatoes. He didn't like... I think the only thing he might have liked was maybe tomatoes, but nothing else that had a color, no peppers, nothing. And we made a garden together. And it's amazing when a child has that vested interest and they see it from seed to now it's this thing, he would eat anything out of that garden. And we grew quite a bit of stuff. He would eat anything out of that garden. 
That's amazing. Now you talked about farm to table. Do you have a farm or do you connect with other farmers? We connect with other farmers. Unfortunately, I wear a lot of hats and I'm just trying to keep my herbs alive at this point. So (laughs) yes, we have a lot of farmers that we connect with here. I think we probably have maybe about six different farms that we source. So fantastic. So fantastic. Um, So how is a naturopath, for people who don't know, how is a naturopath a different kind of doctor? So a naturopath believes in natural medicine first. We're not opposed to allopathic medicine, meaning like the pharmaceuticals, but that is definitely a last resort once you have exhausted everything else. And I tell people, we believe in holistic medicine. So we don't compartmentalize things. So the heart is not separate from the eyes. It's not separate from the thyroid. Everything is one unit. So if you have a headache, well, it could be that something may be going on with your kidneys. So we don't just do, well, what's what happened, you know, two weeks ago. No, we go all the way back to childhood. Like, t- tell me what you ate when you were a kid, because we want to understand How has your immune system been? You know, what are some of the things that may have caused you trauma? These are the things that we get, we delve into as naturopaths. Yeah. It's, it's very similar to functional medicine. Is it exactly the same? Because it seems like it's pretty much the same. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's very similar to functional medicine. I would say functional medicine takes naturopathy to like that next level. Mm-hmm. Like both looking for root cause, looking yes. at the whole person, mm-hmm. not separating the body into different parts. Exactly. Um, awesome. Yes. So what um, challenges have you encountered in, <laughs> in the community, educating people up to naturopathy, to healthy eating? What have been some of your challenges? And when you people hear healthy they hear, or it's synonymous with cardboard and grass. <laughs> and I tell people, do I look like I've missed a meal? Like I've not missed a meal. <laughs> I love to eat and I would not feed you cardboard and grass. You just have to try it. So that's the first thing. And then when they hear naturopathy, unfortunately, where we live, because it's not very prevalent, a lot of people associate that with whack. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, you know, the furthest from the truth, just in naturopathy, we want to help you get to the root. We don't want to just mask your symptoms. And it's science-based. You went to medical school. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's very much science-based. Yes. Yeah. So do you see people privately in addition to having the clean good eats or is the main focus the, the food and the education around the food? So the main focus for me is food. I do see patients on a case-by-case basis, and they generally stem from people coming into our studio and us talking about the different foods that we have. And then people who are just free with, you know, I've got diabetes or I've got high blood pressure. I'm not quite sure what to do. And so from there, we take it on a case-by-case basis. So are, is anybody noticing that their their symptoms or their health are improving? Improving once they yes. see their food. Yeah, so I have a funny story about that. We had a lady, she came in, and we're right near Fort Knox. So she was on post. And the first class that she comes to is a jerk chicken class. That, that was the first class that we had. And she's making this jerk chicken and she's like, and it, it looked beautiful, but she didn't eat it. And I said, Are you okay? She said, Oh yes, I'm I'm just a vegetarian. <sighs> Okay, why are you here? <laughs> was right. like, well, I just heard about your class and I heard about you, so I just wanted to see what it was all about. Right, okay. So the next class she comes to is a seafood class. <laughs> I'm like, why do you keep coming to these classes that are not vegetarian or vegan in nature? Well, on the fifth class that she came to, fifth class, she said, I just want you to know that I've had high blood pressure for years. I've come to this class five times and I've implemented the things that you've said. I go back to the doctor and my blood pressure is almost in range. And I was like, what? <laughs> like even I was in shock just from the things that we've said in class. Like I hadn't seen her 
as a patient, just from the things that we've said in class. So that it works. Nice. Yeah. Yep. It works. So you're, you're an educator. Yeah. You know, you're, and people are taking it in probably at least in part because you're not telling them what to do. You're showing them and they're engaged and they're part of it. And it feels more accessible that way. And food yeah. is a love language. You know, when you feed someone some good food, they feel loved. So, yeah. So um, would you be willing to share your, what do you eat in a day? Oh my goodness. Okay. So it really all depends <laughs> on the day. I've really tried to cut out grains. You know, sometimes the occasional one will get me. I won't lie. <laughs> it will. But I've tried to cut out grains in my diet because I realized that I don't do well with grains. Like when, when I eat, especially the flowers, you know, the wheat flour and all of those things, my stomach puffs up like I'm pregnant and I'm like, oh, we don't need this type of inflammation in our lives anymore. You know, we're still trying to fit into those pants. Let's do that. So yeah, I've, I've cut out those, but I'll eat for breakfast. Maybe I'll have an egg, whether it'll be scrambled, poached, it'll be on a bed of maybe some greens. We'll have maybe, a, I, I don't do pork, but we'll do turkey bacon and we'll, you know, sprinkle that on there. And, you know, I don't drink with my meals. That's, that's a big thing that I don't drink with my meals. And people ask me, why don't you drink with your meals? Well, because you kind of dilute your stomach acid when you are drinking with your meals. And that's how you can get things like acid reflux, that GERD that, you know, so I, I don't do that, but that would probably be a typical breakfast for me for lunch. I don't know. And most of the time I don't eat breakfast. So if I do eat breakfast, it, it will be that I, I like to do intermittent fasting because I realize if I eat breakfast and I'm just snacking throughout the day and that's just for me, everybody's different. But if I eat lunch, then I eat lunch and I'm good. And then I'll eat dinner and then I'm good. And whatever I have for lunch, I'll probably have a repeat for dinner because I don't feel like cooking all the time. <laughs> right? And so, and it varies, you know, you always want to switch up your, your meals, but it'll be, you know, a good portion of a veggie and then a lean meat. Yeah. I like mm -hmm. that you brought up the drink with the, the food and the impact of diluting your stomach acid. Do you have any other like good tips that people could, could take from our oh, conversation today? Oh, loads of them. But <laughs> as far as the water, people are like, well, if I can't drink when I, you know, have my meals, when do I drink? A half an hour before you eat or two hours after you eat, because your body takes all of the energy from doing everything else when you eat to digest your food. And that's why it's also important not to eat right before bed because you will not have a good night's sleep because your body is taking the energy from what they call autophagy or just getting rid of all the dead cells and you know replenishing your organs. That's what the body loves to do at night. So if we've eaten right before we go to sleep, now the energy is taken from that and put into digesting your food so you don't sleep well. So those are two really good tips. <laughs> those are two really good tips. Um, I, I use a, an aura ring to kind of track my, my sleep. Mm -hmm. And on the nights that I eat late, my heart rate variability kind of monitors, it's kind of a good guide um, for, for longevity. Mm -hmm. It lunges. It is yeah. terrible when I eat late. Mm -hmm. And when I was doing Prolon, which I've done three times, which is a very limited um amount of food and mm -hmm. uh, low calorie and definitely not eating late at night. Mm -hmm. And my heart rate variability was the highest it's ever been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because your body can focus on autophagy. Yes. And, and my up. goodness. Yeah. We, in this day and age, the autophagy is real. For those of you who don't know what autophagy is, that's when your cells just to get, get that they die off and they need to leave your body. <laughs> so when, we're talking about all the pesticides that we take into our body, like all the toxins that we have in our body. And our body really just wants to release all of that and get rid of it. But if we're not eating the right foods, if we're not getting good sleep, if we're not eating at decent times and we're just snacking, you know, all throughout the day, our body never has that opportunity to rest and do the other things that it needs to do. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. 
So in addition to having your drinks before mm-hmm. and after you eat instead of with with food, mm-hmm. I, it's okay to take little sips. Like I'll take little sips. Oh, the water itself is it's not chugging. Yeah, water yeah. as long as you're mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. So um, and and not eating before bed. Right. I like to recommend three hours before bed if possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any other tips as a as a naturopath to to anyone who's trying to improve their health? Yeah, well, get rid of the table salt. <laughs> Throw it out. It has no nutritional value for you whatsoever. If you're going to do salt, first I would recommend Celtic salt. And honestly, Celtic salt, like you, even if you get just like a grain of Celtic salt, maybe the size of like a mustard seed, right? And you put that in your mouth, let it dissolve and then you drink your water, you are getting the vitamins and minerals, more more so minerals that you need throughout the day. You will not need the Gatorades because you're gonna get those electrolytes. You're not going to need a lot of the, the, the things that we take in to try to supplement. Now, with that being said, don't go overboard because yes, if you're dealing with high blood pressure and you're just chugging this stuff, it's not going to help you, okay? everything in moderation. Yeah. How is the Celtic salt different than Himalayan sea salt? So the Celtic salt has more minerals in it that the body needs. Himalayan salt is great, but I think Himalayan salt might have like maybe 10 less than what the Celtic salt has. And you want to make sure that it says Celtic sea salt. You do not just want it to say sea salt because you don't know what sea that is. (laughs) So Celtic sea salt. Okay. That's something that I will, that's my take home for today because I've been using Himalayan sea salt. I don't have Celtic sea salt. I've heard about it, Mm -hmm. but now you've inspired me. I'm going to go ahead and do that. (laughs) So you got any more inspiration for us? Oh my goodness. More inspiration. Get rest. Rest is so important. We, we are dealing with an epidemic in this country of depression, of anxiety, and A lot of it is we are not resting well. I'll have dark chocolate every now and then. And people are like, oh, you eat chocolate? Yes, this is my happy pill. (laughs) Because (laughs) dark chocolate is full of magnesium. And magnesium is that feel-good mineral. When we're eating these beige diets, that's what I call the burgers, the, the pastas, all of that. It's just a beige diet. When we look at the ingredients and it says enriched, What that means, and I I was surprised at how many people didn't know what enriched meant. They thought that was a good thing. Enriched just means they've taken all of the natural vitamins and minerals out of it, and they've put in synthetic ones so that it will last longer. Well, our bodies love natural. They don't like synthetic that much. So if we're eating these synthetic foods, we're getting synthetic emotions which is the depression, which is the anxiety. If we start, and I'm not saying, you know, just changing your diet is the end all be all, but that's a great start. Just change some of the things that you are eating. Get more natural vitamins and minerals in you, especially the magnesium, because number one, that's going to help with your digestion. That magnesium citrate is going to help with digestion, get you flowing. But then you have magnesium that's also going to help you rest. And that is what your body needs so that it can replenish itself throughout the night. Yeah. What was your quote? If synthetic foods give synthetic emotions. Oh, that's big. That's big. Um, And you're right. It's epidemic. It is. The kids. It is. I've I've heard from... um, staff and professors at the local college that over half of the kids that that come in are on antidepressants mm-hmm. kids are mm-hmm. unhappy they are yeah. i mean yeah. when you think about the isolation from being in front of a computer all the time and then the level of sugar oh my goodness like that, that's a whole nother podcast but <laughs> if we just minimized that sugar sugar is the biggest drug known to man, cocaine, Oxycontin, and heroin 
combined haven't killed as many people as sugar has. And let's tell you something. When they did a study on rats, and I don't know if you've seen this study, uh, where, yeah, where they, they lit up the dopamine receptors from cocaine and from sugar, and it was three times brighter on sugar, but sugar's legal. <laughs> it's legal, and we give it as a treat, yeah. as a treat. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, they, and, they gave the rats the option of sugar or cocaine, and they went to sugar every time. Every time. <laughs> every time. Yep. Yeah. 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 So, do you have a, a cooking class on? On what, on like a cake for somebody's birthday? Like, what do you do when you cater and it's a birthday party? Right. So I am not a baker. <laughs> I tell people that. But we do have, we have two bakers. One baker, she's actually a vegan and gluten-free baker. She is amazing. And we also use her, because she's a, a farmer. We also use her for our lamb, because we get lamb from her as well. Oh my goodness. She makes the most amazing blondie ever. And she uses chickpeas and radish shoots. Like that does not sound delicious, <laughs> but it is absolutely fabulous. So when I need something, I just call on her. Wow. Have mm -hmm. you tried allulose in addition to the figs or monk fruit or no, that that's on my list to try too. the, the, the RX sugar, the allulose as a, a sugar substitute that's about 70% as sweet as sugar mm -hmm. and apparently some gut benefits. So that maybe that's my, my two cents for you today. Try, okay. try some allulose. Some, yeah. I, I've had some clients who've tried it, who said that it's great. Mm -hmm. um, so anywho, when you brought up beige, mm -hmm. it reminded me of, uh, you know, all the beige food that is the problem, mm -hmm. the, the fries and the hamburgers and the hamburger buns and the tortillas and all the things that are not nutritious for us. I remember an episode. Do you know the chef Jamie Oliver? Oh, love him. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so we lived in Scotland for two years and I followed him when we lived there. There was a show called Ready, Steady, Cook. I absolutely loved it. They had like the red peppers and the green tomatoes and they would come up and they had two chefs and audience members and they'd get the same ingredients and ready, set, go mm -hmm. and cook. And it was, um, they said, ready, steady, go, which our kids said for a long time after that. And it was amazing. I, it was, it was my favorite show and you could watch it with the kids cause it was very good family friendly. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when he came to the United States to try to change things here, I was so excited because what the kids eat in school lunches is horrific. And he went, yeah. he was going to people's houses and taking everything out of the refrigerator and the freezer and sticking it on the table. And everything was beige, just beige, just everything beige. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I love that you're working with kids. I don't know if he was successful in making dramatic change. No, in the you saw that on the food revolution, right? Oh, that broke my heart. That broke yeah. My heart. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're doing the work, you're doing the work one child at a time. And it, I'm so excited for your community that you're there as a resource. Um, and yeah, I hope that everybody listens to your story and says, I want to recreate that in my community. So how did you go about it? Like, are you grant funded? It seems like you should get a lot of grants for what you're doing. We're working on that. We're working on that. I, you know, unfortunately, because what I do is so unfamiliar in this area, a lot of what we had to do is self-funded. And that's okay, you know, because my goal is to get the message out there. And I know once I get this message out there, once people start experiencing this, that the grants are going to flow because I definitely want to get into the school systems. That is my goal. I want to get into the school systems. There are two schools that have lost their mind and allowed me to come in and do culinary classes. <laughs> and I'm so appreciative for these schools because I already see the change in these students. I have one student on, you know, among the many hats that I wear, I, I teach speech and debate. And in my debate class, you know, he was not that great in debate, like, cause you have to think off the top of your head, right? 
but he takes my culinary class and he's a genius. The foods that he creates, like I'll give him the direction, I'll give him the ingredients and he makes this just amazing whatever. And I'm like, I want to eat that. <laughs> I want to eat that. But he's learning. And not only is he learning, I found out that he's taking it back to his parents and his grandparents. That's why we're here. That's why we do it. That's awesome. There's a, an organization, I live in Maryland, um, called Days of Taste. And I learned about them when my 24-year-old was in third grade. And I desperately went to them, like, please come to our county and do what you're doing in these other counties. They're like, okay, we're, we're working on it. We're working on it. But they came into the schools, third, fourth, or fifth grade. So by the time he got to sixth grade, I'm like, oh, he's not going to get it. My daughter was three years behind him. I worked on them. They never came for her. Then 12 years later, I had another child. <laughs> they still never came. They are doing all that they can. Uh -huh. they're, most, they're a lot of volunteers. It's um, mostly nonprofit. I think it's nonprofit. But what they do, they're maybe in three or four counties in the area. They never got to our county. What they do is they go to the usually fourth grade and they have a chef. Well, the first time I think it's not a chef. They have someone come in and just talk about taste. They talk about, they give them bitter chocolate. They give them chocolate with, with sugar. They, they're doing the bitter and the sweet and the salty and um, just learning, tasting things, strawberries and whatnot. The second day, maybe that is the chef. Don't, I, I don't know the details. I can't remember exactly. But that farmer that I mentioned the, mm -hmm. at the biodynamic farm mm -hmm. is the field trip for the second event. Mm -hmm. They go out to the farm. They experience getting their hands in the dirt. They learn about the soil. They see that food comes from the earth. Mm -hmm. and some kids really, like, they don't know. They don't know end of a carrot goes in the ground they don't understand that it's came from the ground mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and then the third day the chef comes into the classroom and they make their own salad mm. and so they're whisking the, the vinegar and the olive oil and they're making their own salad and it's like life-changing yes. like i bet you could get a grant to do that oh and, and that's yeah that's that's really what we're working on i have a farmer she is just absolutely amazing. Like that's what she does. She goes out and she gets grants for all different types of things. So we're working together because I said, I, you know, with the youth classes that we have here, that is definitely something I would like to do to have a collaboration with a farmer where we can bring these kids out there. They can get their hands in the dirt. They can take their shoes off with their feet. Oh my gosh. Put their feet in the dirt. Right. Cause I'm like, yeah, do that. That's the best thing for you. Like do that. <laughs> So, yeah, because I realized when we had we had a, a food truck class, so they had menus that they had to create based on if they were running their own food truck. So their choices were ice cream, pizza, you know, all all the beige foods, right? Those were their choices. <laughs> but when they and it was weird because they all chose the same thing, burgers and ice cream. Right. I was like, OK, so. I made the hamburger buns and then we had the burger, but the burger was, you know, organic beef. They had the peppers and the pickles and the, the tomatoes. When we cut the tomato, one kid didn't know what a tomato looked like whole because he had only seen it in a burger. Yep. That was, that was humbling for me. Yep. That was truly humbling. So I know that what we do here, we definitely can get funded for it. And I'd love to get funded 100% because there are kids that can't afford to come in here. You know, our classes, because of what we do and where we get sourced, they're not cheap, right? And I want to be able to have everyone that wants to come be able to come. Right. Yeah. Speaking of cheap. Mm -hmm. It's not cheap to eat healthy. No. I was, you know, I don't usually ha watch commercial television, but we were watching the football game. Commercial came on for some fast food place and it was like two items 
for like three dollars. I'm like, that's less than a small container of organic blueberries. Like, how do people afford to eat healthy? I mean, part of it is grow it yourself, but yeah, do you have any other things. suggestion? Yes, yes. Skip, skip the grocery store. Don't go to the grocery store. Go straight to the farmer because you're now paying the grocery store to supply your food. You don't know how long it's been sitting there. You don't know where it's come from. You really don't understand what's been done to it before it got to you. So go straight to the farmer. Have a relationship with your farmer. Because when you have that relationship with your farmer, you understand how they grow things. You can go there, see it. Some farmers let you pick it yourself. You know, so definitely when doing that, that's why when we use our local farmers, it was the same price as it was in the grocery store, but I got three times as much from the mm -hmm. farmer as I did from the grocery store. And I tell people eating healthy can be expensive depending on what you eat and how you eat, but it also can be very affordable on the front end as well as the back end. You're saving money on pharmaceuticals, trips to the doctor, time off from work. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you look at the whole picture, mm -hmm. it is so worth it. Yeah. It's so worth it. And I tell people fall in love with cabbage mm -hmm. because it's cheap and you can chop it up and hide it and everything. <laughs> Unless you have thyroid issues, then don't fall in oh. love with cabbage. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So like it's always something, right? It's always something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> personalize it. Right. Personalize. I personalize it. But yes, I, the, the farmer's market is my absolute happy place. Mm -hmm. Like I can't wipe the smile off my face when I'm there. It's, yeah. It is joy, yeah. pure, pure joy. And you're, it's fun to get to know the farmers. And yeah, they'll give you like a little container and stuff as much in there as they can get. And then it lasts for two weeks because they just picked it that morning. Exactly. Where you get it from the grocery store and the, the lettuce that you bought three days ago is already slimy. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I really want to promote you everywhere so how can people find you how if they wanted to connect with you you've written a couple books like yeah. share that part <laughs> so you can oh gosh so yes we, we've written a couple of books my first book is called wife to be and it's actually two books so one is just the cookbook and then the other one is the story of my husband and i because like i said we started with intimacy begins in the kitchen that was our first cooking class so that's the story of my husband and I and all of the ups and downs that we went through in our time being married. And each chapter is based on either a food item <laughs> or some sort of an appliance. For example, the first chapter, well, I think this is the second chapter. It talks about the pressure cooker. Well, you know, the instant pot pressure cooker. We love to cook with that, right? Or either we love it or we're afraid of it. It's one of the two, right? <laughs> so... In this chapter, we talk about a couple that we knew, and every time we saw them, they were always so lovey-dovey, and everything just looked so beautiful, but that was the finished product. We didn't see all of the pressure that was applied to them you know, in their home and, and before what we saw, and marriage is that way. You know, you put in all these yucky ingredients, raw chicken and like all this stuff, you put the top on it, the pressure gets applied to it. And that aroma makes everyone want to come around because now you are good. You are done. And that's what that particular chapter was about. And each at, at the end of each chapter, there are questions. So, for example, before you get married, questions you need to ask your potential spouse <laughs> because... People are getting married left and right and getting divorced even faster. So, you know, how do you want to spend weekends or holidays? Do, are we always going to go to your parents' house? You know, uh, what's your credit like? Those things are important to know, right? Those things are important to know. So that's, that's one book. We also have another book called Reset. And that one is a six-month planner. It has recipes in there. It has a little shopping list, water consumption, all the things that you need to pretty much get your life back on track. So those, those are the books. We also have a sugar detox book coming, Shoot. <laughs> but we do have that coming. And that's, you know, my, my, uh, my two cents on my publications, but to get in touch with me, you can co contact me at clean, good eats 
com. That's the studio side. And then sakinabunch.com. That's the naturopath side. Um, on social media, everything except Snapchat. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't do Snapchat. I'm sorry. I'm not that savvy. <laughs> it's not because I'm bougie. I'm just, I'm just not that savvy to do Snapchat just yet. But you can find me on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. I'm, I'm there. That's awesome. Tell me the name of the first two books again. Wife to Be. So both of them wife. are Wife to Be. And one is just the cookbook. And the okay. other one is Wife to Be. Uh, what is it? A Survivor's Guide for the New and Not So Newlywed. <laughs> so that's for everybody. And then the other one is our Reset Planner. Okay. Mm -hmm. I love that they're interactive. Yes. We have yeah. to do interaction. I, my attention span is about that big. So interaction is a must for me. That's fantastic. I love that. I'm, I'm an occupational therapist and it's all about, it's all about doing, yes. not, not just reading, not yeah. just reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's fantastic. Dr. Bunch, it has been amazing to spend time with you today. Is there anything that, that you want to close with that I haven't touched on? Oh my goodness. Well, I want to thank you for what you do. I don't think that there are enough people in this world that are really focusing on the whole person and then having a platform for other people who do similar to what you do, or at least in that same field, have that same ideology, you put them on your platform. So thank you so much. I appreciate you for that. It's my absolute pleasure. <laughs> Hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. I look forward to our next connection. Thank you. Me too.